This week wow. on Barbell Shrug, we interview Brian McKenzie and Aaron Kafaro. There she is. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> nice. And balls. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Barbell Shrugged. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson. We left Chris Moore at home and we traveled to Cookville, Tennessee. Sorry, Chris. He'll be on the next show, hopefully. Uh, we traveled to Cookville, Tennessee to hang out with Brian McKenzie and Aaron Caffaro. Damn, I asked oh. you right before the show, too. Be, yeah, I know. You got to be Aaron, a good Italian. Aaron Caffaro. 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 <laughs> Yeah. I practiced it and everything. I and know. We had a discussion, right. threw me off. Uh, we're here because you guys are running an athlete sale camp at CrossFit Mayhem. And you're going to be coaching. You're coaching Rich Froning a little bit this week. Yeah. Yeah. I've been working with Rich for kind of a little, little bit on and off for the last couple of years. And then um, a lot this year within the endurance stuff. So we'll be getting in the pool tomorrow. <clears throat> yeah, we're getting in the pool tomorrow. Maybe CTP will be able to catch some of that footage. I'm sure yeah. he will. <laughs> Is that when Rich is Achilles heels right now? Is he's his swimming isn't quite up to par with his weightlifting and his gymnastics? I think if you watched the CrossFit Games last year, you will have noticed a thirtieth plus place <laughs> in the swim event. Uh, he, he he doesn't like that thirtieth marker. No. <laughs> like, yeah, now you have to crawl your way back <laughs> from uh, behind, D digging yeah. yourself out of a hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, that definitely is Achilles heel for you know mm -hmm. f for him. Uh, I don't think so so much anymore. Um, mm -hmm. he, he's been doing some work with a coach out here who's a, uh, she was a D1 swimmer. Um, and he's, between all the guys that have been out here, the feedback has been, his technique has changed a ton, mm -hmm. which is which is great because I, I'm throwing workouts out with, with it at him and right. I can only do so much from being in Southern mm -hmm. California. Right. What's your background with swimming? I know when, when people think Brian McKenzie, like, they think or at least when I think Brian McKenzie, yeah. I think running, yeah. even though you have a swimming and, and, and cycling in your book. Yeah. But do you have a big swimming background as well? Uh, yeah, I actually have a bigger swimming background than I do of a running background. Even much, if, much even if you're not on board? Yeah. <laughs> you're all about some surfing. I'm all about the surfing. Uh, I'm, I'm actually more of a surfer than I am anything, <laughs> but I, um, I I swim one to two times a week mm -hmm. when I'm typically at home. Um but I swam from about the age of four till probably 21 or 22. Um, so almost 20 years. Um, and, you know, got tired of the lane line thing. But um, my I had an extensive background with swimming. So, I, I mean, fairly extensive. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. And Aaron, uh, what's your background? You're probably the most decorated person here. <laughs> yep. <Really? laughs> um, let's see. I started out playing basketball, cross-country track in high school and then walked on to the rowing team at Cal Berkeley mm -hmm. and uh, that worked out pretty well for me so I got invited uh, well won two national championships while I was at Cal and then uh, that kind of boosted me onto the national team and won uh, I think it was about six world champion no three world championships but every time I competed I was on the podium so that Anytime helped. you can't count your world championships, you're doing just fine. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's How a, many did uh, I get again? <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. like like at home there's so many damn medals in the safe that it's just yeah. like you know, between the wow. two golds from the Olympics mm -hmm. and then world championship medals as well. The world championship medals are actually pretty badass looking. So anyway. I hope so. Can we get some pictures of those? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well no, the world championships one, they <gasps> look like a big like quarter. Yeah, but they're really, really shiny. Oh, they look they look a lot. Uh, whatever. We should like other, other, than, other than the jade that's on the uh, the 08 gold medal, which is actually the more expensive. Medal. Yeah, but the Sochi Olympics. Did you hear that they had like part of me like meteorite was put in no. some of the medals? No, I know. Wow, could have had some meteorite. I should have. If she was a winter, if she was on the if I could handle the cold sled team, if I could handle the cold and had a pair, then yeah, I think I would have. I've done. heard of people switching over from 
whatever sport they were in to bobsled. Bobsled. This is like yeah. super common. Yeah. A lot of as track as, and as field athletes. Super fast. Push. Yeah. Yeah. Think really quick and jump in and hold on Duck for dear life. Yeah. I'm trying to remember who I talked to last. I talked to someone last, and they were like, mm-hmm. and then I did some bobsledding. What? <laughs> like it fit. It was like a. It's like they had like the sports background and went bobsledding, and now they're doing this other thing. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. So, what do you think made you so naturally good at rowing, or do you even feel like you're naturally good at rowing? We'll start with there. Um, you kind of just said, I walked on, and then I won a world championship. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes and, and no. I, I would never consider myself a, a naturally talented athlete by any means, especially in rowing. Like mm-hmm. um, The typical rowing athlete is at least six feet tall, mm-hmm. and for women, they weigh you know around 175. So it's typical for women to be six feet tall. Y- yeah. So I, I lived in the land of giants. That's why I like being around CrossFitters, because then I, I feel like I'm a big girl again. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, no, now, uh, you know, I just walked on to uh, at Cal and um, it's not that it was easy. It mm-hmm. was that all the work that I put in, mm-hmm. you could see it paid off. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was kind of like a one to one, like mm-hmm. the more work you put in, the harder you work, the better you got. Mm-hmm. And I really like that. Um, not so much, you know, in basketball, you could work your ass off and still suck. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it it, it kind of just, I think it was right place, right time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I happened to walk on to one of the best teams in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so that helped as well and had one of the best coaches in the country. Um, Specifically so, for the rowing part for of it? For rowing, yeah. How was the strength conditioning at the time? Mm. Did you go in with a big strength background or? No. No? No. So that was all new no, to you yeah. Um, I was all, you know, I was just an endurance athlete. I guess I that's the naturally talented part. I, I'm good at suffering. <laughs> like that's yeah. that's mm-hmm. what I'm good at. That goes I don't a long know. way in, in CrossFit yeah. and rowing. You know, any yeah. sport where you're having to push like that lactic threshold. Yeah. Being able to suffer. It's not necessarily the starting benefit. or getting out there fast. But once, you know, you get into the suffer land. That, that's where I'm at home. So, uh, so I like the endurance sports. Um, and then was 2008 or the, the fall before 2008, you know, I was, I'm undersized for a rower and there's, you know, equation power force times distance couldn't make up for the distance. You know, mm-hmm. I wasn't getting any taller. So mm-hmm. try to work on my force. Yeah. And, uh, my brother introduced me to Kelly Starrett. Uh, over at San Francisco CrossFit and they started giving me supplemental programming Mm -hmm. and I got stronger and I got faster on the water and that's how got into you know the strength and conditioning world Mm -hmm. what did that strength program look like lots of squatting box squatting no uh it was actually so you know we would do we did a lot of volume um as Brian said we we did more volume than marathoners or about the same amount of volume as marathoners and our as a rower as a rower yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. um it was like over 200k 200k a week and um our, and if I, our if races I do like 5k my ass falls asleep yeah. on the concept I, too I, yeah. I think for reference people should understand that, that their race is only two kilometers exactly. so it's like a so seven minute race for mm, women mm-hmm. under <laughs> six minutes so yeah, yeah. typically so wow. <clears throat> it's um you know a little a little counterintuitive but um, still, you know, it just worked on the, on the strength and conditioning piece. And mm-hmm. it obviously seemed to seem to help. <laughs> so 200 K a week, most people are more familiar with like a 500 meter row, which is half a K. Yeah. So you're doing the equivalent of 400, 500 meter rows every single week back then. Uh, Doug likes to think in yeah. math. I know. I'm like, I, th- <laughs> I think like, you lost uh, me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when she, yes. when she like, was oh, training for the Olympics, yeah. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I was trying to break yeah. it down for CrossFitters so they yeah. can understand really what that means. Yeah. yeah. Everyone everyone knows what a 500 meter yes. row means yes. in the CrossFit yes. world. But 400, 400K, they go, I don't know what that yeah. means. So do you have yeah. any tips? This is the most important part of the podcast. Do you have any gotcha. tips uh, from my ass not falling asleep? On a concept two row because that's that's pretty common. Yeah, no, that is common. I know. Uh, uh, actually, a couple things. First thing uh, that I just found out lately from my good position coach over here is you know sit more on your high hamstrings rather than down on on, on your butt. It's going to help you get your back in a better straighter position mm-hmm. um, and be able to use your posterior, not just your anterior. Everybody thinks that they're you know their quads are just blowing up on the on the rowing machine but if you do it correctly you should be able to use both systems right um right. if you're tucked under 
that's when things are going to turn off. Uh, the other thing is get a seat pad. If you don't know, not, if you don't know what that is, just look it up. Seat I've pad. Seen I'll them. show. I'll show you. Rick I'll show you one. one. Yeah. All you have to do is seat pad saves everything, and plus a, it gives you a little lift, so it changes the position of it's. It's almost like wearing an Oli shoe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I've, so. I've 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 uh I've run into rowers who would see my Oli shoes and go, "Oh, that looks a lot like a rowing shoe." Is that is that accurate, or is or was I talking no. to somebody? Oh. <laughs> All right. <then. laughs> the rowing shoes are exactly like track shoes without the spikes. Okay. Yeah, and they you're on footboards, just like the ones on the concept too. Um, you can actually alter the pitch, uh-huh. and then it also helps. You can actually alter how far in and oh, out really? they go, which is very helpful. I I you know, be great to do that on the on the concept too as well. Get a little bit wider. Have foot you been base. on that newer concept too? That kind of it moves with you. Oh, the di- yeah. the dynamic one, yeah, 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 yeah. That's um, that helps you have. It's a little bit truer to the feel of the water. So in the on the concept two, there's uh on the on the original one, there's a little bit of this um, dead spot in the in the front. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but like when you're in compression, to the old one with the wood handle. Uh, no, just the just the normal concept two, not the dynamic oh, okay, one. Okay. Um, and it then it kind of jerks you back when you just when you um, basically get the resistance, mm. and uh, that's not how it feels on the water. You there's, need to be no a, slack on the water. Exactly. There's right. no slack right. unless you what we call miss water, and then you know the right. boat right. jolts. Um, so the dynamic erg was created because it does have more of that. It encourages more acceleration. Like it doesn't have as much resistance in the front. Mm-hmm. Um, and encourages you to build the acceleration throughout. So that's why. More Very like cool. being on yeah. the water. Yeah. Another yeah. difference with the way you guys row is you're rowing on one side. Some of us, yeah. The uh, we They call us sweep donkeys. You go sweep donkeys. <laughs> go to one side. Uh, scholars, they're more uh, technical. Uh-huh. And, you know, there's a single. So that's, you know, person just balling out by themselves. And then there's a double. Um, and a quad, which is four people. Um, they're, yeah, they're definitely a little bit more technical. Uh, you have two oars to handle, not just one. And uh, then sweep is what I did, going off to one side, and you walk around crooked. Yeah, for so you've developed like some massive asymmetries because of oh, this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And we actually just saw like Dr. Ma- uh, Ma- Dr. Nate Maynard yeah. here in Cookville, and he straightened you out. Yep. It's it's getting better. Um, I didn't hear the screams coming in the room from mm-hmm. the room like it was when I was in there. I was screaming. You were <laughs> nice and quiet. Maybe I remember just, that thing about suffering. Yeah, yeah. she likes yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, what That's all have it. you done over the years to to help kind of alleviate some of those asymmetries, just to keep yourself healthy? Yeah. Um, CrossFit. I like to say, uh, and also Broad finding, term. yeah. <laughs> um, also, you know, not trying to favor. Uh, think about, you know, oh, I'm rowing off the right side, so I need to do more left side things. No, I need to actually be more conscious of that and do, you know, lift a barbell, but realize that I'm going to compensate, you know, have this compensation pattern. So, um, you know, lift it, still use both sides, but also, yeah, Yeah. awareness. Yeah. And the, I mean, like the general thinking, even within the rowing world or any world of sports specificity is, that's okay. We're, you're just going to overdevelop that that side so that we can get, you know, oh, yeah. cross that line. You and might break like, a few ribs. You might herniate a few discs. But after that, you'll be good to go. Now, <laughs> now you're initiated. And, and literally, that is what happens yeah. with all of them. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's you see changes that get you know if you actually oh well what if we actually attack the other side? What if we help build this up? And it's like they get better, they get stronger, they don't break down, they don't you know it's just yeah. I mean that happens with almost any sport that's not a strength sport is you develop these, you know, left to right asymmetries, you know, baseball pitchers have, you know, their shoulders are, you know, one side's Mm -hmm. higher or lower than the other. And so I think it's like a good thing for people who have played a sport for a long time where they develop these asymmetries to have, like, they need to be aware where a lot of people probably don't think about what they're doing. They're just going in and training and not thinking, Mm -hmm. you know, I need to make sure that I'm not, you know, using, you know, my right side more, you know, if I'm right-handed, like, maybe I'm using my right side too much or something like that and yeah. let making yeah. sure your left side engages. 
Well, and yep. also we spend so much time in inflection that I feel like, you know, every, even the rowing strength and conditioning is bench pulls, deadlifts, you know, everything in mm-hmm. flexion. And I'm like, well, what about the posterior? Like that, I, we oh, never yeah. addressed that. Mm-hmm. Um, and once I did, everything got stronger. Mm-hmm. It was crazy idea, right? <laughs> so you had some kind of glaring holes in your in your total body strength and you didn't even know yeah. until... I had I, I had no ass. Oh, no. It was, it was, that's that's unacceptable. A, that's a terrible disease it to was, have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most rowers have it. Yeah. Most runners. So at what point uh, did you guys meet? Was that pre or post no ass? Oh, it's it was pre. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. I, I, I <laughs> met her. Like, I'm fixing this I, shit. I, I, <laughs> we originally met in 2009. Is that why it took you two or three years to start dating me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> no. I met her. The truth is out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was like a, a tipping point. Like, oh, yeah. the ass is big enough. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, we originally met in 2009, and uh, she was actually de- coming off of a broken rib at the time, and this was just post-2008 Olympics. Mm. Um, and, uh, she kind of, she'd, she'd already been crossfitting a little bit, but then she had come, she came to a seminar that I was doing actually down in Chula Vista, right next to the, uh, Olympic training center. And she came, spent some time with me and, uh, you know, just started to become more open to ideas and we stayed in contact through that time. And then, uh, New Year's day, uh, 2012 was when we started really dating. Mm-hmm. And that was, uh, and then leading in the 2012 Olympics, we kind of, we messed around with a lot of stuff, um, nutrition, training, monitoring, everything. I, I think the biggest thing we, the biggest change we made was nutrition. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we also started attacking all these things and figuring out what she could do with 200 K a week of other mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. And you said that she's pretty low carb, even with that high volume. At, at that point. Yeah. We actually dropped mm-hmm. carbs, mm-hmm. um, at that point. Um, and, Added increased fats. fat and yeah. you know one of, one of the mm-hmm. typical things you know i just saw that rob actually had done a recent post on adding carbs for a rob lot of wolf. yeah on, on yeah rob wolf on adding carbs and he's seen women that like tend to lose cycles and stuff with things like that <laughs> um so it was uh it, it was interesting because i've seen it that way but i've also seen it where there's just no fat in the diet and that was where a lot of these gals have been at especially at the elite level i even see it with men where they're just terrified of fat intake hmm. and so we the big thing was is that we actually upped her fat intake mm-hmm. um which in lowering the carbs allowed for a lot and we immediately within the first week we saw recovery levels just increase mm-hmm. i mean she was recovering faster she was feeling better it, it, everything was just starting to make mm-hmm. a whole lot more sense right so how he said you were feeling better but how like from your from your perspective or your own thoughts like how were you feeling like what was that transition like um i yeah i from what i remember it definitely wasn't immediate uh you know you kind of have to your body has to adjust to this new fuel source mm-hmm. um i lived the endurance carb life you know you go out to italian food mm-hmm. and eat a big plate of pasta or whatever you got carb load before your races you know (laughs) yeah um so (laughs) so, uh you know and then i when i was introduced to crossfit i started trying out this paleo thing but still you know i was i was scared of fat i'll say it now yeah i thought fat made you fat you know and that's what it's called fat that's what you know it just made sense one to one intuitive it was a good marketing scheme right um so I, I definitely took a little bit of time and, and trust to, you know, he would give me a spoonful of coconut oil and be like, here you go. <laughs> I'm like, okay, here it goes down the hatch. But, you know, there's that transition. And some people call it, you know, the ketogenic flu. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I had a little bit of that. I don't know if it was the volume or, or <laughs> what, but, you know, your mood kind of uh, gets a little messed up you feel like you're you got the flu or you're a little sick um you just don't feel right i've seen that with people who go from high carb to like paleo Mm -hmm. and then like a few days in they're just like i'm like yeah you're just burning a ton of fat yeah yeah and all you want is like to crush some like chips or you know oh it's all you want to do but then you know once you break past that you're good to go um and i yeah it literally you know they say when you get older you're supposed to have less energy and recover, you know, recovery time is supposed to be a lot slower, but Mm -hmm. 
the my early days of rowing was all plagued with injury like mm-hmm. I either had a broken rib a torn QL like this or that you know mm-hmm. throughout my the, or my early career and then towards the end of my career well especially my last year is when I didn't have an injury yeah, okay. he's not getting enough fat to produce the hormones necessary to recover. Exactly. You know, you know, that's what people miss out on. They think about fat making you fat, but they don't think that you need fat to create all these hormones that are necessary for recovery. Yeah, right. Too. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, it, it, I mean, it's it's funny because the norm is these none of these gals get their cycle. Like they're just they're right. not, and they're like, oh yeah. It's kind of like a badge of honor. Yeah, You're like, a, oh, I'm training yeah, hard. I'm training hard <laughs> right now. And right. it's like, mm, mm, no, that's not You're not okay. recovering. You're not, not optimal. Yeah. <laughs> You're actually not optimal. You're actually yeah. dealing with a lot more inflammation at this point. And, you know, it's ban- and like immediately things change for her. So that was that, that was a big, big plus for her. So we shooting for 2016? Two years out? Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you know, I... I am very satisfied with with my rowing career and what I've done so far. Like I, I'm a happy person with the accolades that I've I've collected. Um, there is still a question in my mind. You know, I I still got both of the gold medals through a long slow distance program, um, and so there still is this question in my mind that can you have less injury? And um, you know, as especially for the older rowers or the rowers that are going through a second cycle or even not just rowers, but endurance athletes, mm-hmm. can you still be successful? Can you go fast under an interval based program? Yeah. And Brian, I, I remember, um, I've been following you for years mm. and I remember reading, uh, like how you would crush pizza on yeah. an ultra marathon. Yeah, like, yeah. You were like, fuck it, whatever. Yeah. I'm just going to like, you know, at whatever mile marker, yeah. I have a pizza waiting on uh-huh. me and I just crushed that. And I was like, Interesting, and then like kind of changed your tune uh, a few years ago. Yeah, I don't, I don't well, remember exactly I, what point. I just remember remember what, hearing, the, reading the moment that. I went. The moment I actually started eating paleo was like that. That all changed. Which that was in the last my last hundred miler, which is was in two thousand seven. Mm-hmm. So that I was I was eating clean at that point. I was not. I had eaten cheeseburgers during that but i still eat cheeseburgers today uh, just not with a bun <laughs> typically but um during runs and stuff i would absolutely eat che- pizza i would you know and, and so would guys like like dean carnazes who a lot of people know about you know he mm-hmm. used to eat crush all that stuff he doesn't do any of that anymore we've all, i mean i think we've all kind of wised up a little bit to the point of you know i mean if we actually want to last longer if we actually want to recover quicker because we are not getting younger that we're going to need to smarten up a little bit about this stuff. And, so, and it wasn't that I was being done. It was just like, oh, I need to fuel myself. I need to do this. Right. But then it's like you start to realize, well, Fast, what, what, am I fueling, now, yeah. what am I fueling myself with? And now we're seeing guys, literally, there was a guy who won a uh, 100-miler not too long ago uh, who he's he's on, a, I believe he's on a low-carb diet. I know it's grain-free. Mm-hmm. It's basically paleo. Yeah. He, he took in 1,500 calories total on a 100-mile run. Wow. And you can do that if you're at a point to where you've got your body trained enough to deal with something like that. And you think that's an individual thing, though? You think some people just, no matter what, they're just not going to do well on that low carb for that for that distance? To mm, I don't in the ultra marathon world. No, I I think a lot of people could actually <laughs> think the, in, the intensity is low I think, enough. I think the intensity is low enough. Gotcha. You get you get CrossFitters and people who are doing a ton of intensity. Like you get a CrossFit endurance athlete, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. that's a ton of intensity. You're going to need actually to replace some of those carbohydrates at, at a at a higher mm-hmm. scale, right? You know, and and that's where it'll catch you. And and I've been in that boat. You know, I wanted mm-hmm. to believe that low carb, no carb would work forever, and we've you know. Uh, we, but that was not what happened and you hit walls and you go, okay, I guess I got to add this back in. It doesn't, it doesn't work if you're doing CrossFit competitive style, like you're burning a ton of sugar. Yeah. But when it, you're, it, when you're doing those, in essence, like workouts. a CrossFit, yeah. a CrossFit endurance program is literally going to be, you know, there's going to be two, three days a week where you're doing doubles, if not triples, depending upon how long you're into this and how competitive you want to be um, with your racing. So, you know, and that was, Argue, you know, that was probably one of the first programs that was out there with CrossFit where it was actually putting out two a day workouts, three a day, you know, things like that. 
So when you're doing, two, you know, if you're doing CrossFit in the morning mm-hmm. and then in the evening, <laughs> you're, you're doing 400 meter repeats till your butt falls off. That's so a lot of, you know, yeah. that's a whole lot of tap in that glycolytic system. Yeah. In which case, I mean, what, what do you do for carbs at that point? Well, I mean, you've got sweet potatoes, you got things like that. Can you handle milk? Can you handle stuff like that? I mean, like with you, it's like, you know, you got the goat milk thing. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, 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 a, there's a positive right there, right? <laughs> you know, but it, it's all based on what you can handle, what your body is not allergic to, what you don't have poor reactions to. And I, mm-hmm. and I honestly believe that unless you're willing to pull everything out that you potentially could be allergic to, there's no way to really find out unless you're going to get extensive, expensive blood work done right now. Yeah. Which, you know, five to 10 years from now, that's not going to be extensive, expensive. It's going to be a prick of the finger. Boom. Here's what you're allergic to here. You know? And, yeah. You know, so. so right now people, what, what a good idea would be like remove anything that could make you allergic or that you could be allergic to add things in, you know, yeah. go clean for like 30 days, add things in every third day, you add in it. something new. Yeah. Absolutely. And then you'll find out like, uh, you know, sometimes like <laughs> my wife, she did that and then she added in like maybe 10 things. It's like two months into this thing. Yeah. And then she adds tomatoes back in and tomatoes destroyer. And it's like, Oh, all wow. right. So, so now she knows she, like something that everyone's like, well, tomatoes are good for you type of thing. Right. They're, They're good for paleo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But like, you know, tomatoes just upset her stomach. And so she just can't, especially if she's going to train that day. So yeah. I think, I think a lot of people have it. heard to do that, to go cold Turkey, basically just meat and veggies and then add stuff in slowly Typically, what do you start with when you add stuff back in? Like, what what's the the most common like first five foods that you would dairy. add back in? Dairy is the first I, thing I, you add I, back in. I I'd toss around dairy mm-hmm. uh, just because like most people love dairy. <laughs> you know, it's like okay, mm-hmm. well let's find out if you've got that allergy if if there's a reaction, and you'll no. know immediately mm-hmm. with the dairy thing. You know, um, you'll then maybe typically bread or grains th- things that you know you that uh, you really crave and like mm-hmm. um this be- also becomes a very slippery slope for a lot of people and mm-hmm. where they go from being paleo or low carb back right back into high carb because they're like oh yeah i want my dairy i want my my bread i want this i want that and then all of a sudden it's like you know you're on a high carb diet again mm-hmm. where you know for most people that's just not as optimal and mm-hmm. it, what we just because it's functioned well for what it's been mm-hmm. doesn't mean that that's necessarily the, in, in my experience, mm-hmm. it's because I've been high carb and I've had every one of my athletes high carb in the past. Mm-hmm. The comparison between being high carb to paleo and actually monitoring and watching this type of stuff mm-hmm. is night and day. The, just how, the recoverability, all that stuff. How would you describe high carb, like a uh, percentage of calories and uh, what would you, what would you define as like low, typically low I carb? I think over 60%. You know? would be high carb. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then what would low carb look like on average? I guess uh, you would say on average, I, I'd say probably under 40. So kind of like more of a zone. Yeah. Type more prescription. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and you'll see typically even with like zone people in CrossFit is it's like you're on zone for so long that it's like you're at like two times, three times, four times fat, five times fat. I mean, I walked into CrossFit and glass and looked at me and was like, what are you on? Like a 18 block, five times fat. I'm like, how'd you know that? <laughs> he's like kid you're doing ultra marathons like yeah. you've got to be getting those calories from something you know well, it's funny though i remember reading like crossfit journal and people I remember you know i played around with zone for about three months and then um and then i started tweaking from there yeah but then people would go oh what do you do and i go oh well, you know i do like three times fat you know this many blocks three times fat but then i started thinking well you're not doing zone anymore so like i saw people that, writing in the crossfit journal that's my <laughs> they're like they're like i do zone plus this i'm like why are you telling people you do zone? Because you're not. That, you're doing zone and then you're bastardizing. We're it. on the same page with that. <laughs> I lasted a week. Oh, I was geez. like. <laughs> I am not measuring anything I, anymore. Obviously with the numbers and everything well, I was like funny, at, out the door. <laughs> I've been measuring things since I was 15 because I was, I was a weird kid. And really? I, know, I know everything by like <laughs> grams and calories. So <laughs> grams and calories and then they and then you want to like make it in blocks now and that just confused me. I think it probably helps people that have never counted calories before mm-hmm. and grams but it for somebody who's got experience with it, I, I, I kind of got lost. I'm like, yeah. It's just, I, it's just I was one, one more layer of complexity. Yeah, well, it'd be, it'd be like, it'd be yeah. like taking grams and now, we, now we're doing blocks, which are a bunch of grams. And then if we did cubes, which are a bunch of blocks, and you, you take one cube of this and one cube of this, then you got to figure out how many blocks are in it. You got to figure out how many blocks per gram. It's just one more layer of complexity that's not needed if you're already comfortable with grams. But, but I do find that it does help people who've never counted calories before. I, I agree. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I agree. But mm-hmm. I, you know, I like, I always, you know, I, 
it's it's you get somebody to learn hey here's how much you actually have to put into your system in order to function mm -hmm. better and we adjust until you feel really good mm -hmm. then you understand how much you actually need when you're training and yep. then it's like nothing is ever spot on Mm -hmm. It takes, it takes a, you know, it takes a gram or, you know, it takes a calorie or a gram of carbohydrate just to digest a gram of, you know, to, to digest a calorie of carbohydrate. Right. So like if you're counting calories, did you adjust for that? Or, you know, it's, it doesn't all add up, but the fact is, is you start to see the, the deal to where you can actually get your hormones regulated, your body in a, in, in a place to where you can actually synthesize everything to maximize potential and recoverability and I think that's the important part and then once you've done something like that like if I can get somebody to weigh and measure for three weeks good done never yeah. do it again yeah mm -hmm. don't have to do it you don't have to do it Bledsoe did <laughs> <You don't. laughs> Just once they have the perspective of what their plate is supposed to look like yeah then they exactly got it. and I, I mean you take somebody like uh you know like like rich who's just like oh i don't do anything i just oh, get man. away you know i barely eat and i you know yeah he does he does not eat that the, much the and, funny thing i remember uh this is like maybe a year year and a half ago so i was talking about mike mcgoldrick last night we we're standing around and yeah. mike mcgoldrick is a games athlete and he good friends with him and he is more dialed in than any athlete like he's, he's able to count everything it's very disciplined and then he came and hang out to hang out with rich for a weekend and train and like i'm getting like text messages like this dude is eating pop tarts and s'mores and he's eating cereal for dinner and <laughs> like he was just he was like just totally blown away and he, he recognizes that that would not work for him but it works for rich i think rich is at a point where rich's body has adapted to just whatever he wants, to whatever do. He wants it to do. <laughs> but and you as a human being that if you think you can step into something like that like you're just not gonna do it like I, I, I'm positive she would melt <laughs> if she were to start crushing cereal and eating pop tarts and doing things like that I, I mean we've seen it with just dairy type of stuff you know yeah, with her. my whole life would fall apart yeah. yeah just everything the well, marriage that, the house yeah everything <laughs> <laughs> that's the point like I think a lot of uh, you know, people try to look and see what the top athletes are doing and they think that is the ideal. Right. It's not the ideal. Like, it, even with position and how you move, like, you know, Jason Kalipa, like, yeah, he can pull a great score on 2K and, and you know, half marathon, but is that the ideal way to row? No, not necessarily. He could probably do it better if he just cleaned up his, his form, is that what you're saying? Uh, or... Aaron's look, calling look at, you out, Jason. I know. Look, <laughs> I'm just saying, look at the people at the top of their sport, right. you know, like, or, or not just the, the top of their sport, but look at the, the positional, the best position you should be in, or look at the best, you know, research out there on, on diet. What is the ideal? Yeah. Have that be your ideal, not what, you know, Rich is eating or yeah, I think how Jason's of, rowing. A lot or, of these guys are doing things that appear to us to be not ideal, but because they're doing well, why change? Yeah. Like if, if I'm being ex extremely successful, why would I change? Could they do better? Maybe. Yeah. But yeah. you know, why change if you're doing the best? But yeah, what you're saying is, is don't use those guys as an example. Ooh. Like yeah. people, there will be a time and a place that everybody will change. Yeah. And it always happens. And when you're 26, 27, right. it, it, you'd st and you're, you know, you've you might handle inflammation a little bit differently at 26 you than you do at 36. And you've, you know, you, yeah, it's just, it's a totally different game. It's a totally different ball game. And nobody really takes that into context. They're, they're always, oh, well, if he's eating peanut butter and jelly, guess what? That's what I'm doing. Yeah. And it's like, dude, you don't understand. Yeah, I think don't get it. I've talked to this about, I think we may have mentioned, talked about it a little bit last night and I've had many conversations about this is that people look at what Rich is doing right now and want to mimic what he does right now, but never take into account everything he did leading up till now. Maybe right. you should start where he started and then build your way up. Yeah. Like the first year he went to the games, how many workouts a day was he doing? Two, three, maybe. <laughs> Tops. Yeah, yeah, and he was getting them. Was it, I talked to him about that. I was like, "How do you train?" I saw him at sectionals, and then I saw him again at regionals. And he was like, "Oh, you know, I just go to a website and I just, I just pick one, and then I go to another website." He was just going to different gyms' websites and yeah. cherry picking workouts. But he was doing like two or three a day, and at that time, that like just blew my mind. I was like, "All right, 
Yeah, and, and I mean, everybody wants the secret, you know, like they, everybody talks about this and there is no secret, mm-hmm. you know, and the fact that he's just training or just eating what he wants, that's actually not the answer either. It's you're, you you got to look at the entire path and it's like you look at her entire path of her career mm-hmm. and it was in the <clears throat> beginning, it caught up with her pretty quickly in at 2008 Olympics, you know, where it was like she they, they won a gold, but. Mm-hmm. What did that feel like? Where was she at? And it was, you know, broken ribs, torn, you know, QLs. It was thing, you know, and this is something they all deal with. And then it's like, how do I fix that? How do I not, how does it not feel like that to where in 2012 she's in tears because she felt like she could have gone harder and raced another race. Yeah. And I'm like, no, that's exactly what it's supposed to feel like. Like mm-hmm. that is how you should cross a finish line in the Olympics. If you're winning, like Usain Bolt is smiling at seven seventy meters mm-hmm. and looking at cameras because it's over <laughs> because it's done you know right. and that was what it, that's what happens with the, that's what happened with women's aid i mean it was over from 500 meters on yeah done yeah i was freaking out you know but she, they, uh, <laughs> the, the, the tape tells a different story you know it's right. just like they were out in front the whole time by a by a big margin i think another thing too people who come from like that volume background that come into crossfit they can usually handle a lot of things thrown at them and it's almost like you have to lower the volume for them. But if they come from a strength background, they can't jump into the volume. So you got to build them up over time. Yeah. 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 To- absolutely. Y- you'll, you'll see different variables accelerate like a strength background accelerates mm-hmm. obviously with anything that's got weight and mm-hmm. you can handle lots of weight, things like that. Whereas an endurance athlete is just going to be able to go and go and go and go and go and tack it on tack. I mean, that was my experience. Mm-hmm. I came into, you know, into cross it with this enormous ro- aerobic base, but I mm-hmm. still had no idea what intensity was. And, you know, doing a six minute Fran for your first time, I was, you know, on my ass, <laughs> there wasn't enough oxygen in the room and, you know, <laughs> There, I thought I had this enormous, you know, right capacity, mm-hmm. and it was like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> and that makes the wheels spin, man. That it's yeah. like, whoa, what is that? Mm-hmm. All right, we're gonna take a break real quick. When we come back, we're gonna find out exactly what you guys are doing in Cookville. The secret. Oh. Yeah, we're gonna release the secret. <laughs>
love girl sing alone Technique Quad. Uh, today's video is a part of a series of videos we're doing on the snatch technique. Uh, specifically, this video is about the triple extension phase of the second pull. My name is Doug Larson. This is Alex Macklin. Alex is one of our faction and barbell shrug weightlifting coaches. Uh, like I said, today's video is all about the second pull. We've already done start position on a separate video, uh, the first pull and the transition, which is kind of the first part of the second pull. Again, today is all about the triple extension phase of the second pull. If we break the lift down, again, we've, we've covered each phase in other videos, so go ahead and get into a good start position and then slowly start going through your first pull. So your Alex is in a solid start position. As it comes off the ground, this is first pull. Once he starts pushing his knees under the bar, that's the transition. And then right here, he's pausing. He's in the power position right now. And this is basically the start of the triple extension. So from here, you can see uh, where Alex has good technique. His shoulders are back. He's not rolling his shoulders forward. Go and roll your shoulders forward. Yeah, like that. There you go. So he's not shoulder forward like this. His shoulders are back together. His arms are straight. Go ahead and bend your elbows a little bit. Okay, his arms aren't bent like that. Some people do do that, but when you're first learning, you shouldn't try to start like that. So arms are locked out straight. The bar is hitting him right at the crease of his hip. He's not hitting upper thigh, especially on the snatch. So go ahead and hit a little bit low. Yeah, so he's not hitting low like that. He's hitting right where his, right where his hip bends in the crease of his hip. Okay? If you come to the front, okay, see his knees are pretty much over his toes. They're not diving in too much. Go ahead and make them horribly dive in. Okay, they're not diving in like that, so push your knees out as far as you can. Make that diamond shape. Some people will even exaggerate that a little bit, and they'll, they'll be more like this, where they have a little bit of a diamond where their knees are pushed out even further than their toes. They'll be here and then here when they're in that full power position. His heels are on the ground. As he went through the transition, go ahead and do a bad transition where your heels come off the ground. As he passes his knees and he pushes his knees under the bar, a lot of people will bring their, their heels off the ground like that. Okay, you don't want to be there. You want to be very heel heavy. There you go, perfect. So now go, go ahead and do it right. As he goes through his first pull, he wants to rock towards his heels. When he pushes his knees under the bar, he wants to be 
putting all of his weight back onto his heels. That way, when he gets in the power position, he's very heel heavy. He could probably even wiggle his toes off the ground if he wanted to. There you go. So that's a good spot. Now that his weight is over his heels, the bar should be coming into him through that first pull in that transition. That way, when he goes to extend and catch the bar overhead, the bar is coming from here back over where he's going to catch, and he's not having to get out in front and jump forward to get under the weight. Okay, so go ahead and do, uh, go ahead and do one more full movement. And I want you to watch how Alex, as he goes through the whole, the whole movement, he's getting the weight back onto his heels. And if Chris can come to the side, I want you to look right. I want you to look right at the end of the bar here and see how as he comes off the floor, the bar comes into him. And then right when he gets to his hip, that's when the bar is going to be the most back. It's going to come into him the whole time. And when he gets to here, since he's so heel heavy and the bars come back into him, it'll continue to come back even a little bit more. If I use a, if I use a vertical reference line like this, you can see how the bar will come back into him a little bit. There you go, just like that. If he does it again and he does it wrong and, he, and he's toe heavy, then the bar won't, the bar won't come back quite as much if, if he stays on his toes. There you go. So you see the bar didn't move back quite as much. When that happens, he ten, people tend to miss the lift out in front of them. Now that's how to get into a perfect power position. Once you get there and you've done a, a perfect first pull and a perfect transition, nice and slow setting up that second pull, once you get into a good spot then uh, in your power position, that's when it's time to explode and just pull the bar as hard as you freaking can and pull it overhead. So I want you to go nice and slow, exaggerate a little bit through your first pull and your transition, and then explode on the second pull, almost like it's two separate sections, just to exaggerate, exaggerate that point. So he's slow here, slow here, slow here. Once you get to a second pull, that's when he's going to explode and pull the bar as hard as you freaking can, pull the bar as hard as you freaking can, pull the bar as hard as you freaking can, pull the bar as hard as you freaking can. So you can be slow here, slow here, slow here, and then fast. There you go. So you can see the first pull and the transition are really just setting up the explosive part, which is the second pull. And if you end up in, a, in a, a position that gives you good leverage, then the second pull won't feel as heavy as it would if you were out of position. Uh, for the catch and the recovery on the, on the second pull, once I get to the power position and then I get that full triple extension and I'm here, my shoulders are down, my arms are straight, and I pretty much lifted the weight as high as it's going to go, I'm going to keep pulling on the bar. But at that point, all my shrug and my arm action is going to be pulling myself under the weight. And we're going to cover that in a separate video, which is going to focus on the catch and the recovery phase of the lift. All right, for more Technique Wad videos, you can go to barbellshrug.com and click on the Technique Wad tab at the top of the page. Or you can buy that shirt. <laughs> and we're back. Boom. Hanging out in Cookville. We got Brian McKenzie, Aaron Cafaro. Oh. oh, boom! Round two, got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the uh, big secret? Big secret that put him on the spot with that one. Which which big secret? Yeah, the, you know the real reason you guys are here. Uh, uh training camp, oh, training camp. Yeah, uh, kind of timed it to where Aaron was doing a seminar last weekend. Uh, wanted to come out and hang out with Thomas and his wife. Um, and. Thomas is super cool. Yeah. I've met him several times, but we got to spend more time with him in the last day, like, yeah. than I have before. Yeah. yeah. He's super cool. Thomas is man. And then uh, working with Thomas, working with Rich all this week, and then leading into 14.1, and we're doing a training camp this weekend at, 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 at CrossFit Mayhem with Athlete Cell. So, they're going to announce the WOD tomorrow yep. night. Yep. And then uh, everyone at Mayhem is going to crush it on Friday night. Yeah, yeah. And then have a big party. It's They'll have a big crazy. party, yeah. That's and right. And then do another three or four workouts on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> so 14.1 Friday night and then four workouts on Saturday. Five workouts on Saturday and then uh, I believe four workouts on Sunday. Damn. Yeah. yeah. A training camp. We've got to get these kids dosed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> dosed. <laughs> Walk away with something and then recover during the week and right. uh, then you got to do 14.2 on uh, it next just take Monday week. through Thursday off. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah so now, Aaron, Aaron, do you participate in any of that? You can do the open and whatnot? Uh, yeah, I signed up for it last year. Mm -hmm. I'll probably, I haven't signed up yet, but I feel like we'll You'll sign have to, we'll you sign have to up. like Monday oh, to really? sign up. Oh, yeah. well, there you go. Just show my support, you know. <laughs> uh, but there's, I'm not competitive. Just doing it for fun. Yeah, 
Yeah. I'm I'm big girl in the CrossFit world, so bullshit. You know. <laughs> <laughs> She's the most competitive person in the room at all times. No. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We should get like a game of chicken foot or something going on tonight. Get crazy. <laughs> so we were, we were in here the other day and we were all talking to Thomas, Thomas Cox. And yes. he was saying that uh, when coaching football players, there's kind of three types of guys that he trains. There's the guys that they train super hard all week long. And then on Saturday, they do exactly what they did in practice. Exact same intensity, exact same. Like if they run a route, they run it the exact same way in the game. Whatever they do in practice is exactly how the game's going to go. And they know that that person is super consistent every single time. Then there's other guys who they train super hard all week, get in the game, and just screw up the whole thing. They, they just they can't compete under pressure. They always find a way to mess it up. Mm -hmm. Then there's guys that are the total opposite. They kind of just like coast through practice and they – they work pretty hard, but not like amazingly hard. And then something about game day, they just they just turn it on and they're incredible. Yeah. Are you one of those three avatars? Um, He's asking if you're blue. <laughs> <laughs> um, blue? I, uh, Never mind. Yeah. It's a the, movie the reference. Blue, the blue avatars. Uh, from the movie. Uh, oh, uh, I do. I do have a braid, though. I get distracted anytime anyone <laughs> uses the word connect avatar. Their braid? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, I don't know what camp I fall in. I, I definitely... Uh, <laughs> Brian's Brian, like, you don't, you don't know? Brian knows well, exactly no, which camp you I fall know, in. I, I, <laughs> He's I, like, I, you are not self-aware. I know which one I, I don't fall in. Shh, I don't fall... Humility I, actually is her, one of her downfalls. Oh, really? She, okay. She's so humble with everything that she tends to overdo it. No. She's number one. She works her tail off mm -hmm. and then puts everything together when it's time to put it together so you're, always, you're super consistent yes uh, yeah. yeah but on on game day like there's something there that you just can't replicate in training mm -hmm. um but i think but you perform the, well yeah yeah i i look forward to competing or testing because mm -hmm. that's just where i am at that point like i don't feel any extra pressure because i'm like it, I, this is You're not a basket case on on competition day. No, no, I, I even for I the Olympics. Get, I get excited. Everybody's Dude. like, "Oh, how do you mm -hmm. deal with butterflies?" I'm like, if they aren't there, that's when I get nervous because then the <clears> first <throat> part of that race is gonna hurt really bad, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I I it was a trip for me to see her at at the Olympics. I was there for ten days and um, I saw her a couple times, uh, but you, like when they raced, like she saw me she saw her family it was just stone cold mm -hmm. nothing it's such a game i've I'm never not, not heartless it, it's, it's just no no, no 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 did she scare you <laughs> no it didn't scare me no 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 it didn't scare it, it, it's intriguing to me because right. as a coach you look at all these athletes you see these athletes but it's like you know it was i, I relate it to somebody who's like kind of like spec ops or something military when it's like yeah. it's time to go in and do something like you see all this stuff and you meet these guys and you work mm -hmm. with them and there, there's a switch. They're, they're just certain individuals that have it, and it's boom, I'm on, mm -hmm. and I I'm not. I credit our coach for that a lot too, because you know, in the in the boat, he can't go out there with us. He can't right. be on the sidelines yelling at us. He and he knew that. He just tried to give us as much confidence in ourselves and say, "You're ready." I mean, the pre-race talk. Some you know, sometimes they were like <laughs> profound, but usually it's just like, "You're ready." You know, it's not. He's not going to hold your hand. Um, He's not going to, you know, tell you secret move to do. It's just like, go do what you do every day. You know, mm -hmm. you're prepared, you're ready. And that, I think that's the best thing that, uh, you know, one of those, the best things about my, my coach for the Olympic team was that he did, he had a really good job of getting us ready and, and confident in ourselves. Whereas sometimes I see with these other athletes, they still need to have their hand held and they, they almost don't take responsibility for all the work that they put in. Mm -hmm. they, they attribute it to their coach mm -hmm. more than anything. And they're like, Oh, you know, I, I don't know how to, how to approach this workout without the, my coach telling me, well, yeah, you do like get out there, mm -hmm. go, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. I, and also it also helps to be, uh, in a boat with a lot of other women who are alpha females <laughs> who are exactly like me it was just the environment it was the environment that I was in um and I guess that's part of the humility thing is that y you know I was I was not any better than the rest of my teammates and I wouldn't get anywhere without the rest of my teammates you know mm -hmm. rowing is the ultimate team sport mm -hmm. um but you do I mean it's not like we were all passive and you know like oh no you go first you go first no we were it was a cat fight like it was 
literally like a shark tank like training we would be tearing each other apart and it was it was the oddest thing we were enemies witnessed in sport literally yeah yeah. because here's a Hmm. team of women there's like i think how many you guys start off with 30 roughly Uh, in the program something like that yeah in the you know and it just chips away it just chips they they just start out 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 out, it's like a celebration when someone leaves like no, during the attrition, no, but or everyone because I mean, I've, I've seen programs where like yeah. when someone leaves, it's almost like some people are like celebrating because that means yeah. they well, there 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 are certain individuals that I think that yeah, everybody's like always like yes, thank God, right. yeah. yeah, that was a de- that was a detriment, that was somebody who was not helping the team. But yeah. you've got a bunch of women who most of these girls are literally Ivy Leaguers mm-hmm. who went from a Ivy League school <laughs> out to a national team who are no law who are not making any money. Mm-hmm. even though they're in a professional sport mm-hmm. who are willing to sacrifice everything and anything to win a race. And they're all, nobody wants to share any b- b- on the team. Nobody on the team wants to share anything that they're doing <laughs> extra or le- w- oh, like, really? Oh yeah. And then the coach, you know, I, I have to give it to her, to her coach because he does, he did create an environment mm-hmm. like nothing I've ever seen where there's just a command of respect mm-hmm. But a respect that did not build that did, that did not enable athletes. It empowered athletes, mm-hmm. and it told these girls to step up when it was time to step up. You're not. I'm not going to hold your hand ever. You're going to go out and you're going to do what you're supposed to do. What your mm-hmm. damn job is. Mm-hmm. And it, that that was it. And you just don't see a lot of that, you know. And I mean, that's kind of the school I. I, I really was brought up in and it was just like there's no hand holding there's no mm-hmm. you don't you're you have a job to go do go do it mm-hmm. you know everyone's responsible for themselves yes mm-hmm. and that's what they and but when it came together I mean when these girls had to go compete boom they were a team <laughs> all of a sudden yeah. you have like this shark tank of women who are some of the most educated on the planet who are like who could be lawyers and you know doctors and like just these alpha females somewhere in the professional world that have chosen yeah. not to do that and take no money vying for an olympic medal and it's pretty interesting we were just stoked that we didn't have to compete against each other again <laughs> we were yeah. like yeah, the rest of the world okay few. at least i don't have to <laughs> compete against you know caroline <laughs> wow yeah I, and it, you, you see that you know you know, I, my, my understanding with a lot of the you know cross athletes that i've seen is just like you see a lot of these kids who are not the ones that need to be handheld, and they are mm. winning. <laughs> mm-hmm. You were saying the other day that, that rowers and, and other Olympic athletes, especially the ones that aren't making any money, which is probably most Olympic athletes, mm-hmm. like they are willing to sacrifice everything, as you just said. And yes. Yesterday you were mentioning something about like they would just call random families and just be like, hey, uh, can I stay with you? Yeah. Which is like Ho- that's a hard families. thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just like host families. Yeah. yeah like, like maybe elaborate on that. They, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there's potential for things to happen with us, but there's, you know, like these girls will literally go from college to, or whatever each year. And they contact a family in the area where they're going to mm-hmm. literally be, have to train and say, Hey, I can't afford to really live. I'm wondering if you might be able to let me have a room in your house and I'll live with you while I train for the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And it's a yes or no, and, and there are in in Princeton, it, it, there are these families that have literally opened up their homes mm-hmm. to these athletes and have t- and are taking care of these athletes mm-hmm. and allowed them to do that. And they have literally packed up everything from where they're from, whether it's you know you're from Yale or whether you're from Stanford or whether you're from Cal, packed up, moved to Princeton, New Jersey, mm-hmm. and you know that's where they're going. And that's something that you were saying a lot of cross athletes are starting to realize now is that they have to start training like that. They need to not have a job. They have to train multiple times a day. Like if you want to get to the to the, the upper level, if you want to go to the games and be successful at the games, and especially if you want a podium, you can't have a job and, and no. be taking care of your it two ain't kids happen. Ain't gonna and happen. be having like a, a different business you're trying to grow on the side yeah. and trying to train multiple, multiple times a day. What I think we'll see, yeah, you're. I absolutely agree with you. I, I, I think right now it's the person who wins it that, that's doing that and there's a few that aren't doing it below yeah. that but and then there's guys that own gyms but are they really working at gyms like mike was saying last yeah. night yeah. but anybody who's working a job and literally trying to train to win the crossfit games they don't understand what energy means <laughs> they don't <laughs> understand that they don't understand recovery mm-hmm. and literally you know you got somebody who's doing 200 kilometers a week who's doing some extra work on the side, you mm-hmm. know, to make sure that we 
fix those imbalances, who's eating a diet, she's waking up, mm-hmm. eating, going to practice, coming home, eating, sleeping, <laughs> going to practice, mm-hmm. coming home, eating, sleeping, training again. <laughs> yeah. It, so you're taking mul- multiple naps a day when you're getting ready for the Olympics? There was one or two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least uh, one. Yeah, Every day. No, it, Minimum. I would I do that so I can work. From like 10 to 14 <laughs> hours. Like, yeah. There's some, some days yeah, we, like monitored. we had a long, long week, long, hard week. I mm-hmm. would sleep 14 hours, you know, like 10 at, at night and then a four hour nap. And that was my recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, some people most people probably never worked hard enough where they could accomplish that they wouldn't be able to sleep all that time (laughs) right they wouldn't be able to stay asleep they would just lie there she is a professional professional sleeper sleeper. (laughs) i'm not kidding dude it's like Mm -hmm. a bear hibernating the moment she goes to sleep (laughs) but she's also one of those people who goes into deep sleep immediately like it's an it's an immediately start she's jumping twitching you you know the deep sleep is happening where it's like you know somebody like me is not who's constantly thinking and trying to fix things and wants to do things is like i'm not a deep sleeper until it's late you know she's deep sleep immediately probably a sign of success or potential success yes yeah i mean 14 hours a day i mean and a lot of people complain and i tell them uh you know get nine they're like i've got to get nine yeah like 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 i'm crazy i'm like yeah but you look at like the top athletes all they do is is uh yeah, yeah train take naps eat I think uh, you, my friend Max, he described uh, like what a professional athlete looks like. He's like, it's it's uh, training, sleeping, and playing video games. Like, <laughs> like, you should not be having to worry about anything. Because other than, it's not other a, than the video games, I think it was movies and, and books. Yeah, yeah, but it's yeah. not about, it's about like avoiding stress. Like, yeah. yes. if you're working, exactly. even if you're spending that same time where that guy's playing video games, reading books, whatever, and you're spending that same amount of time, but you're working, there's, that stress is stress. And a lot of people don't see it that way. And they think, well, I can just, I can work a nine to five. I can train, you know, two or three times a day somehow, you know, maybe in the morning, lunch, in the evening, but you're still not going to get, you're not getting enough recovery mm-hmm. to get the, the correct adaptation that you're looking for. It's, it's stress and uh, willpower. I, I, I'm totally of the belief that you can, you can <clears throat> grow your willpower, yeah. but I think it is finite. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you are, you know, you have to make a lot of decisions based on a bunch of other things, you know, if you're working, you have to make decisions at the office and then you have to make decisions on, you know, how to train and it's, it's fine. You're, you're going to tap yourself out. Um, and my only decision, my, my decision was how am I going to get better today? You Mm -hmm. know, like, yeah, that's, that was my focus. Um, but you know. I guess I grew up. I'm I'm not that good of a multitasker. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, get into that, uh, grow my myself a little bit more now that you know I'm not training full time. But I, I really like focusing on one thing because that you know it preserves your willpower and your your stress levels. And it you know obviously I don't know for me it worked. <laughs> mm-hmm. Willpower is an interesting thing that a lot of people don't know very much about. It's, it's tough to do research on such a an intangible thing like willpower. Like, mm-hmm. what does that mean? How would you measure it? How would you test that? But the the little that I know about it, I've seen studies where they take people and they'll, they'll do something along the, along the lines of, hey, cookies aren't good for you. They'll give like a little talk to people. And then they'll make one group make like two decisions, even though they're not hard decisions. Mm-hmm. They'll make another group make like 10 decisions in the same period of time. And then they'll offer those people cookies. And they can find a statistical significant difference between the group that had to make 10 decisions. They're much more likely to go uh, and give in mm-hmm. and eat the cookie yep. compared to the other group. And that's been consistently tested and found to be what happens with people when they have to make too many, too many decisions throughout the day. That's why people tell you to do the most important part of your day or the most important thing of your day first before you get distracted, before you get worn down, before you get tired, before you lose your willpower. Because if you wait... You know, like if you wait until after work to work out or whatever, mm-hmm. you're much just, less likely to do it. On. You don't want to go yeah. to your doctor late in the afternoon because that's <laughs> that's when you're going to get a bad prescription. Yeah. Go early in the go. day. Yeah, when he's fresh. Yeah, well, that's another thing decisions. too. Yeah, they, they've done they've done that with uh, with judges in court. Yeah. Like oh people, wow, they're just yeah. fed what, what up. Fed that? up by the end of the day. Yeah, there's um, you're cooked. <laughs> they talk about in the powerful engagement with Tony Schwartz and yeah. Jim Lehrer. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, I don't remember the other <sighs> book that talked about it then, but yeah, like if you can go, if you like 
even if you get like a speaking ticket or whatever you want to like get it taken off your record if you go in the morning when everybody's rested you're you're like four times less likely to to get them to, or to uh, get the outcome that you're looking for yeah. to get it taken off your record than like if you go like right before lunch where everybody's like hungry and tired mm-hmm. if you come after lunch it, like totally, it, it, it like swings back the other way where everyone's kind of like they just they just had a break they got some food they relaxed for a little bit wow. and they're much more lenient again i think they did that yeah. i think they did a study with like criminal like judges that were like looking at like murderers and stuff like that and like it's like if it's late in the afternoon people were getting the axe and like if it's people people it's, early it's in the day life. yeah it's just your life but it's you know they they looked at all these cases and found that that was kind of what was going on wow. it's like it's like holy shit like if, for some reason i end up in a predicament i'm gonna try and make every court thing happen in the morning like <laughs> 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 nah, you never know what can happen, you know. Or just I bring the judge it. a snack. Yep, yeah, oh, bring him. Right. There you go. I always have to have snacks. Yes, mm-hmm. that's the other thing. Snacky cakes. She has a fe- <laughs> she has a fear <laughs> of hunger. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I call well, it when my bow. When, <laughs> <laughs> when my wife and I uh, were first were hunger. married, she would actually <laughs> carry bars around in her purse, not for her, but for me. Cause I would get so agitated when I got hungry. <laughs> She's like, he's he gets angry when he gets hungry. And Typically, like, that's like what happens. It's like, it's that's like she found out about that's what she found out about me. That's what Aaron figured out with me. It was like, yeah, <laughs> dude, have you eaten? Because you are nasty. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, let's wrap this up. What do you guys want to promote? We got uh, athlete cell camps. We have uh, CrossFit endurance. We got three fuel over here. <laughs> Miss three fuel right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. I heard you're the brains behind the operation. Shit, she is. She runs the whole show. No, yeah. Just... See, there's that humility thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is like, no, not me, not me. No. <laughs> so um, tell yeah. us what it is. Three fuel. Uh, for people that don't I know. was the. I guess I was the uh, OG guinea pig for you know when I changed my diet in, the, in this last Olympic cycle, uh, trying to find a supplement that I could take out in the boat with me. You were out there for two hours or even, you know, something I could take immediately after that when I couldn't have the convenience of real food. Mm-hmm. Um, and so Brian and, um, you know, he had a business partner and they went into the lab and, you know, started testing some stuff out, some HDP waxing maize for the carbs and, and um, you know, came up with a three macronutrient supplement, you know, the highest quality uh, whey protein you can find on the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what is it? HDP waxy maize is therm- called thermocarb. Mm-hmm. And then a fat, of course, coconut, coconut milk. milk. Mm-hmm. So those three macronutrients in one supplement, and I would take it out in the boat and I wouldn't bonk. I yeah. would stay steady. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was, it was a lifesaver. Cause then, you know, you see everybody else, literally they would have lunches in the bottom of the boat you know bars Goo, bananas cliff shots all slash, these little right, sugar things and right. you would see them like we would have multiple pieces you would see them go up and go down and up and down and it was you know i think that helped my recovery yeah. a lot too so that was three fuel and uh you know they were they basically made it for themselves and their athletes and i was like hey i think other people would like to have some of this mm-hmm. <laughs> too uh so i've you know had yeah it started off as a very selfish venture yeah. and then mm-hmm. turned quickly turned into you know oh yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should make this a business yeah make something for yourself <laughs> and everyone starts asking about where can i get yeah. that and then you go oh maybe i should sell well, this. I, I, like at every seminar we did you know I, with crossfit endurance is the seminars i we run for with crossfit is you know people well what do you fuel yourself with if we're gonna eat clean yeah <laughs> and it's like well because <laughs> yeah, liquid calories do come in pretty handy when you're an athlete and you're training a lot yeah yeah absolutely i mean it just it's an inconvenience to stuff you know a chicken breast and broccoli and <laughs> some other what a, an avocado down your throat yeah i don't have tra- uh, i don't have the appetite sometimes for that yeah, yeah. getting it down stuff yeah. especially right in the middle of my workout <laughs> yeah i usually just don't have it available yeah yeah so that's how three fuel came about and yeah it's it's been taken off where uh we're coming out with the chocolate. That's been like the biggest thing. I guess everybody likes their, you know, recovery shakes and chocolate. So that's that's coming. But um, how else am I going to get a fix? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what else are we doing? Athlete cell, which we already talked about. Yeah. You got you got your book out there still. I got my book out there. Power speed endurance. We got another book coming out probably between late spring and mid early summer with the uh, Unbreakable Runner. So that'll be a kind of a manifestation of everything I've done with power speed endurance and then 
kind of looking at it from a perspective of how we came to these conclusions, why we came to these conclusions, where things have gone and mm -hmm. uh, giving programming out for mm -hmm. anywhere from, from a basic person or a novice person to, mm -hmm. you know, intermediate to an elite. Mm -hmm. We didn't actually talk that much about CrossFit endurance specifically on this show, but we did mention it a ton on the last show. What ep yeah. episode was that? Wow. Eight, episode 82. Wow. I know. Look at this. How guy, many right? episodes? He's a you? savant. He can just, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Wow. <laughs> I mean, just rolled that off. <laughs> yeah, 82. So that was like 20 weeks ago. Yeah. 23 weeks ago. Well, that was our first oh, live episode. Right. In, oh, yeah. in front of a uh, live audience. At, at, Have we done at, one since? At the gym. <laughs> Like, yeah. oh, it went yeah. so terribly. We <laughs> offended so many people live. Did that, we? Uh, <laughs> so many F-bombs. We, we can't do it again. Yeah, can't, yeah. Yeah. can't play that in front of your kids on the way home from work, right? No. Chris Moore had a few drinks. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. It only accelerated things for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He'll never make it this far on this episode. So he, he won't even know we talked about him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, make sure you get to barbellshrug.com. Sign up for the newsletter so we can inform you of when we... Uh, Get these podcasts out and a bunch of other cool stuff that we do. <laughs> Thanks, Excellent. guys. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bam. Yeah.